What if the world as we know it is coming to an end? Think about it for a second. Cities full of lights, airplanes crossing the sky, factories producing goods nonstop. All of this depends on one thing, an endless source of cheap and accessible energy. But what happens when that energy starts to disappear? What happens when the promises of sustainability crumble under the weight of reality? This is the question posed by the Olduvai theory. And while many consider it alarmist, the cycles of history have shown that no civilization is immune to collapse. Today we explore this theory in depth, but we will not do it alone. We will see how it connects with other worldviews. The Cycles of Boom and Bust by Ray Dalio, The Promises of the 2030 Agenda, and even the warnings that Isaac Asimov left us in his Foundation series. Because in the end, what is at stake is not only our present, but our future as a species. The Old Divide Theory, proposed by Richard Duncan, is based on a very simple principle. All civilizations need energy to survive. From the Roman Empire to the Mayan civilization, history is full of examples of societies that grew, reached their peak, and eventually collapsed when they exhausted their resources. Duncan argues that our industrial civilization will be no exception. In fact, he assures us that we are immersed in a cycle defined by three phases, the peak, overexploitation, and collapse. The peak began with the Industrial Revolution when we learned to harness fossil fuels on a large scale. This access to cheap energy allowed for the exponential growth of the population, technology, and the economy. But with the peak came overexploitation. We became completely dependent on finite resources such as oil, gas, and coal. Resources that are not only limited but are being consumed at an unsustainable rate. And the worst part is that there don't seem to be any viable alternatives on the horizon that can replace them in time. Duncan predicts that this dependency will inevitably lead us to collapse. After 2030, energy consumption per person will begin to fall drastically, marking the beginning of an era of decline. But the interesting thing is that this cycle does not occur in a vacuum. Economic and political elites, as Ray Dalio explains, are the first to prepare for these moments of crisis. Dalio, a well-known investor, describes how societies go through cycles of boom and bust. During the boom, the elites accumulate wealth and power, while the middle and lower classes support the system. But in times of decline, these same elites protect their interests even at the cost of sacrificing the rest of the population. A clear example was the financial crisis of 2008. While millions of people lost their jobs and homes, the banks and corporations responsible were rescued with public funds. The elites not only survived the collapse, they came out stronger. And the same could happen when the old device cycle reaches its critical point. So what does this mean for us? If the elites are preparing to maintain their lifestyle, what is left for the rest? This is where global agendas such as the 2030 Agenda come in. But are they really designed to save us, or are they simply another tool to maintain control? The Old Dubai theory points to the depletion of natural resources as one of the key factors in collapse. Our civilization depends almost entirely on fossil fuels like oil, natural gas, and coal. These resources have fueled our economic and technological growth, but they have a fundamental problem. They are not renewable. Since the Industrial Revolution, we have extracted these resources at an accelerated pace. Cheap energy has been the pillar of our economies, but the most accessible deposits are already depleted. Now we depend on sources that are increasingly difficult to exploit, such as shale oil or deep sea reserves, which increases cost and reduces efficiency. This phenomenon not only affects energy, we are also depleting essential minerals such as lithium, cobalt, and rare earths necessary for supposedly renewable technologies. Even fresh water, a resource we take for granted, is in crisis in many parts of the world. The solution presented by the elites to face this crisis is Agenda 2030, an action plan adopted by the United Nations that promises to ensure affordable and sustainable energy for all, among other objectives. But how realistic is this promise? The energy transition proposed by Agenda 2030 is based on renewable energies such as solar and wind power. However, these technologies have significant limitations. The production of solar panels and wind turbines depends on materials that are finite and highly polluting in their extraction. In addition, renewable energies cannot provide the same energy density as fossil fuels, which means that they are not enough to sustain the current level of consumption. So if these solutions are not viable on a large scale, what is Agenda 2030 really after? Some critics argue that it is not about saving civilization, but about managing its decline 
concentrating even more power in the hands of the elites. Under the pretext of sustainability, the measures of Agenda 2030 impose restrictions that mainly affect the general population, while the elites maintain their lifestyle. For example, while ordinary people are being asked to reduce their carbon footprint, limit their energy consumption and accept restrictions on their mobility, the elites continue to travel by private jet, organizing luxury conferences and accumulating resources. These contradictions are not accidents, they are the essence of the system. In fact, social control is a key piece of Agenda 2030. The total digitalization of the economy, including the implementation of centralized digital currencies, allows governments and corporations to monitor every transaction. This not only ensures that you comply with the new sustainability rules, but also limits your ability to resist. In this context, Agenda 2030 does not seem to be a solution to the collapse predicted by the Olduvai theory. Rather, it is a tool designed for elites to manage the crisis while protecting their interests. This leaves us with a disturbing question. Are we being prepared for a world where scarcity and restrictions are the norm, but only for some? When Richard Duncan described the energy collapse in the Olduvai theory, he wasn't just talking about the end of our industrial civilization. He was also pointing to the beginning of a period of chaos, a kind of dark age where our infrastructure, economies, and political systems would crumble, leaving humanity in a precarious state. This scenario is not new. In science fiction, Isaac Asimov imagined it decades ago in his Foundation series. In that universe, the vast galactic empire is on the verge of collapse. But while most of the population is unaware of what is to come, a scientific elite, led by Hari Seldon, develops a discipline called psychohistory. This science combines math and sociology to predict the behavior of the masses and, most importantly, plan a strategy to shorten the dark age that will follow the collapse. Selden's plan is based on the creation of a foundation, an organization tasked with preserving scientific and technological knowledge. But here's the important detail. This foundation does not seek to prevent the collapse. Selden knows that collapse is inevitable. His goal is not to save the empire but to make sure that those who survive the collapse are in a position of power to rebuild it in their favor. This approach resonates deeply with what we are seeing today. The elites are not interested in preventing energy decline or social collapse. Rather they seem to be working on strategies to manage this collapse while ensuring their survival and dominance. The Agenda 2030, as we saw before, does not offer real solutions but rather control mechanisms that guarantee that, when the crisis arrives, the masses will be contained and the elites protected. Let's go back to the Foundation series. In one of the key moments of the story, Selden appears in a pre-recorded message and explains that the crises facing the Foundation are necessary to strengthen its control. Isn't this similar to how current crises, from the pandemic to climate change, have been used to implement measures that restrict our freedoms while concentrating power in the hands of a few, the message is clear. In times of collapse knowledge and control are the most powerful weapons, and while we debate how to survive the elites are already designing their own foundation, a structure that will allow them to preserve their wealth and power in a world where cheap energy will no longer be accessible. So, if collapse is inevitable, as both Duncan and Asimov predict, the real question is, how can we, as individuals and as a society, avoid becoming mere pawns in a plan designed to benefit a select few? If there's one thing the Olduvai theory and history have in common, it's the idea of cycles. Civilizations are born, they grow, they reach their peak, and eventually they crumble. And even though each collapse might seem unique, they all share a pattern. The depletion of important resources, the inability to adapt, and the disconnect between the elites and the rest of the people. In 1972, a group of scientists from MIT led by Donella Meadows published a report called The Limits to Growth. This study used mathematical models to predict how population growth, resource consumption, and pollution would affect a planet with limited resources. Their conclusions were clear. If we keep growing at the current rate, we will face a global collapse by the middle of the 21st century. The surprising thing is that many of these predictions have come true. Climate change, water scarcity, and rising energy prices are all signs that we are approaching those limits. And this is where the Olduvai theory comes in because it accurately describes how this collapse could happen, a sudden decline in our ability to maintain modern life. But we don't need to look only to the future to understand this. 
Historian Jared Diamond, in his book Collapse How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, shows us examples throughout history of civilizations that faced similar problems. The Maya, for example, depended on very intensive agriculture to feed their population. When the land became depleted and droughts became more frequent, their civilization collapsed. Easter Island is another example. Its inhabitants cut down all the trees on the island to build statues, wiping out the resources they needed to survive. What Diamond highlights and what's especially relevant today is the role of elites in these collapses. In many civilizations the elites clung to their power and privileges even when the signs of collapse were obvious. Instead of changing their way of life, they passed the cost onto the lower classes, accelerating the fall. This is precisely what we're seeing now. The global elites are not reducing their consumption or changing their habits. While they ask us to accept austerity measures in the name of sustainability, they continue to accumulate wealth and enjoy a lifestyle that's out of reach for most of us. So the question is, can we break this cycle? Or are we destined to repeat the mistakes of the Maya, the inhabitants of Easter Island, and so many other civilizations that fell before us? The answer might lie in our ability to recognize these patterns and act before it's too late. But, as we'll see in the next part, the solutions they offer us are often part of the problem. Every time someone mentions the Olduvai theory or predictions of global collapse, the most common response is usually, technology will save us. From electric cars to solar energy, it seems that technological progress has the power to solve all our problems. But is this really true? Or are these solutions just delaying the inevitable while aggravating other problems? One of the key arguments in favor of technology is that it allows us to do more with less. For example, modern engines are much more efficient than those from 50 years ago, and LED bulbs consume a fraction of the energy that incandescent bulbs used. But here is where a phenomenon known as the Jevons paradox comes into play. Proposed by the economist William Stanley Jevons in 1865, this paradox states that when we improve the efficiency and the use of a resource, we do not reduce its total consumption. On the contrary, we increase it. Why? Because by making it more accessible and cheaper, we encourage greater use. Let's look at electric cars as an example. Although they are more efficient than combustion engines, their manufacture depends on materials such as lithium, cobalt and rare earths, whose extraction and processing have high environmental costs. In addition, global demand for vehicles continues to increase, which means that we are using more resources, not less. The same goes for solar and wind energy. Although these technologies are essential to reduce carbon emissions, they require huge amounts of minerals and energy for their manufacture. And since we continue to increase our energy demand, these solutions are not replacing fossil fuels but complementing them. In other words, we are adding new forms of consumption not eliminating the old ones. But this is not the only problem. Technological dependence also makes us vulnerable. What happens when systems fail? If a solar panel or a wind turbine breaks down, we need a complex and expensive infrastructure to repair or replace them. In a scenario of energy decline such as the one predicted by Olduvai, maintaining this infrastructure could be unfeasible. That is why some critics argue that these technological solutions are not designed to save us, but to keep the current system running a little longer, while the elites consolidate their control. The promises of a sustainable future become a distraction, a mirage that makes us believe that everything will be fine while we head towards the abyss. So, the question is not whether technology can solve our problems. The real question is, are we using technology to redesign our way of life, or simply to prolong a model that has already proven to be unsustainable? So far we have seen how the old Duvai theory and historical cycles predict the collapse of our industrial civilization and how technological solutions seem to be only a temporary patch. But there is a key piece in this puzzle that we cannot ignore, the 2030 Agenda. Presented as a plan for a fairer, more sustainable and inclusive world, the 2030 Agenda promises to combat climate change, eradicate poverty and guarantee clean energy for all. Sounds good, right? But as the saying goes, the devil is in the details. One of the pillars of the 2030 Agenda is the total digitization of our societies. This includes everything from digital currencies to mass surveillance systems to monitor energy consumption, carbon emissions and even our transportation habits. All under the argument that we need to better manage our resources to save the planet. But what does this digitization really imply? 
First, let's think about the impact of centralized digital currencies. Unlike cash, these currencies allow governments and corporations to track every transaction we make. This not only eliminates our financial privacy, but also opens the door to unprecedented control. Imagine a world where you cannot buy food because you have exceeded your monthly carbon limit, or where your movements are restricted because you did not comply with the new energy regulations. Is this really sustainability or is it a covert surveillance system? Then there is the issue of restrictions. Under the 2030 agenda, the idea of sustainability translates into sacrifices, but not for everyone. While the general population faces limits on consumption, energy use, and mobility, the elites continue to live as always. Or do you think billionaires will stop flying their private jets or building their mega mansions? These rules are not designed for them. They are designed for us. This level of control is not a distant conspiracy. We are already seeing it. During the pandemic, many of the surveillance tools implemented under the pretext of public health demonstrated how easy it is to restrict freedom of movement and control the masses. The 2030 agenda is no different. It promises a sustainable future, but its mechanisms seem to be more focused on consolidating power than on solving the fundamental problems we face. This is where we return to the old Uvai theory. If energy collapse is inevitable, the elites are not designing a plan to avoid it. They are designing a system to control it. While the general population struggles to adapt to a world of scarcity, the elites are already creating their own survival bubbles, private cities, exclusive access to advanced technologies and accumulation of critical resources. So the real question is not whether the 2030 agenda will save the planet. The question is, are we willing to surrender our freedoms in the name of a sustainable future that only benefits a few? We have come a long way. From the old Dubai theory, which predicts the collapse of our industrial civilization, to the control strategies proposed by the 2030 Agenda, through the historical and fictional warnings of Jared Diamond and Isaac Asimov. But now we come to the most important question. What can we do in the face of this panorama? The first thing is to accept reality. Collapse, to some extent, is inevitable. The resources that sustain our modern world are being depleted, and technological alternatives will not be enough to maintain this level of consumption. History shows us that civilizations that have ignored their natural limits have ended in collapse, but it also teaches us that some have managed to adapt and survive. So how can we prepare? The first thing is to reject the narrative that the 2030 Agenda is our only solution. This plan, under the pretext of sustainability, is not designed to save us all, but to consolidate the control of the elites. Instead of waiting for global institutions to solve our problems, we must focus on building resilience at the local level. This means regaining control over our communities and resources. For example, promoting energy self-sufficiency through decentralized renewable sources such as community solar panels. Promote food sovereignty through local and sustainable agriculture. And above all, strengthen our support networks because in times of crisis, connection with others is our greatest strength. We must also question and resist the advance of digital control that threatens our freedoms. Although digital currencies and surveillance systems are presented as tools for progress, we must ask ourselves, at what cost? If we give up our privacy and autonomy in exchange for empty promises, we will not only be victims of collapse, but also prisoners of a system that strips us of all power. Finally, we need an alternative vision of the future, one that is not based on unlimited growth or the accumulation of wealth for a few. Perhaps, as Isaac Asimov suggested in Foundation, we should focus on preserving knowledge and building a society that values cooperation over competition, sustainability over consumption. The old Uvai theory offers us a warning, but not an immovable destiny. Collapse may be inevitable, but how we face it is up to us. And if history teaches us anything, it is that great transformations always begin with small actions. We may not be able to stop the decline, but we can ensure that the future that comes is not completely controlled by those who only seek their own benefit. The question now is, are you ready to take control of your future, or will you let others decide for you?